The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program, depending on their content. Okay, uh, I need to recognize a couple other things here and then we'll get rolling along. Uh, the graduate student that's been doing all this work is the first author listed up here, Yuxing Yang. And my collaborator is Amit Varma, I think is someplace back here, and yeah, there he is in the back of the room, uh, at Purdue. And these tests were done in Bowen Laboratory uh, at Purdue University. There's maybe one more test that's still coming and I'll try to remember to mention that along the way. And this work was uh, supported by, funded by Westinghouse Electric Corporation. Uh, I'm going to use the first, the first slide here, just a little kind of cartoon or schematic because I can't show you the actual drawings from where this comes from, but uh, represents a wall uh, in the interior of a containment structure. And you know, typical wall, we've got reinforcement in both directions, two mats of steel. Uh, but these walls tend to be very thick, ranging anywhere from, I think, as small as 18 inches to three feet thick. They're very heavily reinforced. And what I have not shown up here uh, is ties that run between the mats of steel. So when you combine all this together, it gets very difficult to construct. And so the the desire was to go from conventional ties to using T-headed reinforcement, a whole lot easier to put together. But the NRC wanted to uh, have it demonstrated that this will work the same. Uh, I'm going to spend probably too much time on this one slide, but it's to get us rolling along to what we finally actually tested. It, for the size of things considered and doing it at full scale, it's not really practical to think we could take anything even like this and try to hold on to it in some way. And then the loading that was of concern was a rapid pressurization from one side of the wall that would be loading the wall out of plane. A, a crazy expensive test if you tried to do the thing at, at very, very large scale. So what we did was to take a slice out of uh, and what Westinghouse was happy with and, and comfortable with was take a slice out of the wall and do a shear test basically with the kinds of reinforcement and size bars and so forth and ties that would be used in these walls in the actual construction. Um, so if you keep that in mind, and I've mentioned a lot of these things already, uh, really large volumes of reinforcement, the construction's difficult. We wanted to look at replacing the conventional ties with the T-headed reinforcement and then verify is there any compromise in strength and behavior if we use the T-headed reinforcement? So that's what we're, we're really looking into here is, uh, is there any compromise in shear strength? And this has been, the walls would have been designed, or, or the, if you're looking at ties, according to 349, and then replacing the conventional ties with T-headed reinforcement. So the way we went about this, uh, we've got a, going to have beams that are tested in a, four-point bending. Uh, the material properties nominally are over here, 60 KSI, 4,000 PSI, but we really expect these to be around 70 and 6,000. We were developing the test specimens. We wanted to ensure with some reasonable certainty that we were going to experience shear failures, really flexure shear failures, and uh, not just have a bunch of flexural failures. So our target using these expected strengths was to come up with a, a ratio of the applied moment that would generate a shear failure compared with the flexural strength that we could calculate, not to exceed about 80%. That was our target in developing the testing program. And so we did this shear strength calculation. This is what's in 349. Uh, but again, we wanted some confidence that 
we were going to get the kind of failure we expected to see and really test the ties, if you will, in all of the tests. So we also used Turian and Frosch's uh, relationship that they published back in 2003. And if you go back and look at that publication, um, the little k factor that's out here, and so it's k times root f prime c, the width of the beam that we're testing, and then this c here is the crack section depth of the, of the section. We also investigated this because, as you're going to see in a little bit, these are not your typical beams. They've got a crazy amount of reinforcement, top and bottom, equal amounts. So they're not over-reinforced because they've got a huge amount of compression steel in them. But really, I don't think in the, the shear database that was used back when Turian and Frosch did this, they looked at beams that had these ridiculous amounts of reinforcement reinforced in that manner. So it was kind of a fallback to, to check it that way. Uh, Everything else calculated like we're used to, V sub S, a combination of VC and VS. Oh, and I started to say in the K factor that we use to try and predict strength was 6.8. That's not the one that you would use for design, I think. They recommended a factor of five if you were going to try and implement this in a design code. So as you'll see in coming up here, doubly reinforced specimens to represent this, these mats of steel on both sides of the wall uh, or both surfaces of the wall. Uh, number 11 bars, the reinforcement ratios, top and bottom range in that range, extremely high. And in these walls, the expectation is, depending on the walls, the, these ties can be anywhere from fives to nines, so they're extremely large bars. And then conventional concrete used. So here's a, a little schematic of what the cages look like when we put them together. And I'm going to explain one other thing away here in a second. So this is what the alternating ties look like with 135s on one end and 90s that kind of get lost down here, but you can see them alternating. All of the beam specimens were three foot wide, so we had a pretty representative uh, distribution of reinforcement in the width of these specimens, and they weren't all collected at the outside edges or all stuffed in the middle of the beam. Um, the other thing we did so that we, and this was a little tightrope that we had to walk, the tests, we were balancing a lot of different things. Don't let the A over D ratio get too small. Um, to try and use five sevens and nines, we had to go to different size beams and still not let the A over D ratio get too small. And we had to keep the flexural efficiency up pretty high or we couldn't achieve enough flexural strength without even shoving more reinforcement in these beams. So the one thing that somebody in here might take exception to is the bars that I've called transverse reinforcement here is probably not a very appropriate name. These, these represent the bars going in the other direction in the wall, okay, when you've got the mat of steel. And so we simply hook the ties over that single bar rather than go over the intersection of where bars cross each other because that would reduce, shove the flexural steel closer to the center, and it would be hard to build them in a comparable way with the T-heads and looping those guys over the tops of the pairs of bars. Okay, so we got the, the steel, flexural steel all in the same place. And I think I can accelerate a little bit from this point on. Uh, so there ends up being the set of tests that we have done so far. Beam depths ranging from 18 to 36. Um, the notation means these are with T-headed bars. The R just means it's a replicate of the one that we've already tested. The S is the conventional reinforcement. Um, Let's see, there's the over D ratio, two and a half. There was a little bit of concern, was that too small? So we ended up down here at the, <clears throat> at the end doing a fourth series where we had two of the three with a, an A over D ratio of three and a half, and you'll see how that turns out here shortly. So there's a, a photo of what one of the beam specimen looks like. There's a support here, there's another one over there. We're loading it at two points here. Big overhang because we had number 11 bars and we needed to anchor those guys and we didn't want anchorage distress out in that little piece of the span that's hanging over. So we have a lot of beam hanging past the simple supports. And then the loading protocol was loading up to 25% of expect, when I say expected shear strength, just using the 349 equation and plugging in our measured material properties because the data test would go test the materials and know what they actually were. And this was done simply because this was a protocol that was used in a previous test series 
that was done for Westinghouse. So there was just a consistency in that. Uh, I noticed a mistake here when I was looking at these last night and I couldn't get to another slide to replace it. So uh, this one, all the reinforcements in it, this is one with the ties. Uh, the wood is about ready to get stripped out of there. That was in there to hold the mats of steel at the right elevation until everything got tied in and strip them out, cast the beam. What I didn't notice when I first threw these together is this is still missing the top set of bars <laughs> that go above the ones that are already here. So you can imagine what it looks like. And there are the T-heads. And these happen to be uh, from 36 by 36 inch cross sections, uh, the biggest beams that we tested. And so there's, uh, I'm just going to show a smattering of results here, not all 12. Uh, this is for, so 36 inch deep beam. This had the number nine ties. Uh, this is just based on crack section stiffness, so it gave us some idea where this thing was going to go. And you can see how we loaded on up, got up to above what 349, the code equation would say. This one basically got to 500 kips. And then it, it starts to trickle off. I'm going to show you the specimen when it reached failure, and it doesn't look like what most of us are used to when we do this kind of test. And it's because of all that steel in there. It's just dumping the load into the compression steel. And it actually unloads pretty gradually. Uh, and to give you an idea, this isn't all that important other than that's the calculated moment curvature relationship for the beam. So you get a sense of where were we at relative to yielding longitudinal reinforcement in these beams. And this was pretty typical of what happened with all of the test specimens. Uh, we had, I didn't spend a bunch of time talking about instrumentation, but we put strain gauges on longitudinal bars out in the constant moment region. We instrumented a number of the stirrups or ties, and I'll show you those results. Just for entertainment purposes, uh, the agreement's not bad. It's much better on the tension side uh, than it was up here on the compression side. And now here is some of the strain readings that we got uh, out of the instrumented transverse reinforcement. And you can see where the bars are that have. And we did these at mid-height, and that's important for a reason I'm going to mention just a little bit later on. So this is from the first two load cycles. Uh, it's probably a little too small, but if you look at the strain readings that are here, and this looks like there's something significant happening, but hold on, I'm going to go to the third and the fourth cycle and everything shown on there, and the strains will get much larger. But what you'll notice typically in all of these is for either side of the beam, either shear span, uh, the two that ended up with the biggest strains would typically be these two stirrups, or at least measured, I should say, because they're at mid-height. They're not necessarily at the critical location to, to measure strains. Uh, when we go and push this thing all the way out to failure, this noise back here is what you were seeing on the previous slide. Uh, the ones associated with closest to the loading point, these are the ones where we develop the very big strains. And this is not really painted on the beam. Uh, and uh, the lights are a little bright, so the cracks don't, crack patterns don't show up very well. They will better on the second specimen I'll show you, but if you look hard here, you can see the shear cracks, the loading points back here. This just uh, superimposed over this image shows you where the reinforcement is located uh, while we were doing the test. That's one shear span. That's the other one. This was the one where failure occurred. And what we saw in this one, we did develop some crushing up here, but it was pretty controlled because as this concrete's crushing, it was dumping load into all of that compression steel that was up on top. And we could see that in the strain readings up there. Those, those came up in compression. Uh, now, if I take the, one of the partners to this, this is the one with the conventional reinforcement. And the behavior looks very similar, although the failure is a little lower. Remember, the other one went to 500 kips. Uh, strain readings, similar sorts of things that we saw in the previous one. Same two adjacent to the loading point. We measured the largest uh, strains there. And I am pretty confident, based on something I'll show you here in just a couple minutes, that these really were the, the, the ties with the most force being developed in them. Uh, when we go out then to the third and the fourth cycle, uh, this one, we, we stopped getting any additional um, significant deformation in the stirrups on this side of the beam. And this guy, we, we got considerably more. And the damage looks that way. This is the side. We're looking at the opposite side of the beam, so it doesn't match right to left. 
but uh, these cracks really opened up substantially and you see the localized crushing that's up here and I noticed one other thing uh, I think we have this our little superimposed image upside down um, this tails actually over here and this hooks down here and vice versa you'll see why in a minute the other side not much the cracks developed but they never they stopped opening uh, at that point but here's what we saw um, on that side with the big opening cracks the anchorage started to fail and then not only it happened with both stirrups in the central part of the beam that's spalling off that's the 90 degree hook trying to undo itself spalled off concrete on the bottom of the beam and the top of the beam that was the adjacent the, the stirrup closer to the loading point that's why I say I think I got that image backwards a little bit later on. When we look at the strengths, summarize all 12 tests have been done so far. The first two in each of these pairs are the uh, specimens with the T heads. Uh, you know, it's probably not statistically significant. Um, we only have one with the conventional reinforcement, but it just turns out that it is a little bit less for every one of those tests. And then when we looked at the, the different A over D ratio, uh, there was no clear trend there. Uh, they're all about the same. If you normalize these with respect to the 349 prediction, uh, they all but one of the conventional ones attains uh, at least the code prediction. Uh, that is not the specimen I was showing you. That's the one that failed and had the bars start to straighten out. And then just because I showed it earlier, not that it was really of interest to Westinghouse, uh, but on this slide I've got a, probably too much information, uh, but three different things here. The blue dots correspond for each of the specimens with what you would calculate using the measured material properties for uh, conventional reinforcement. Uh, if you use the Turian and Frosch design equation, it's actually more conservative, it's way up here. If you use the K of 6.8, uh, that we lifted out of their paper. It does a pretty good job of predicting the actual strength. So, uh, and I forgot to mention it at the appropriate time. We think we're going to do one more test, or I should say the student's going to do one more test. Uh, back at the spring meeting, Committee 349 was really interested in, they, they saw some of these preliminary results, and said, well, how much force is being developed at the heads? kind of dumb in hindsight, we didn't put any gauges there. We put them at mid-height, hoping we'd intercept some cracks. I can guess it's pretty close to the yield strength of the bar, but we're going to do that just for the fun of it and find out uh, how much is actually getting developed when you get to the head and not just what's happening out in mid-height of, uh, of the specimen. So. Very, very preliminarily here, the T-headed the specimens developed higher strength than the fewer in number conventional specimens. Um, 349 pretty much does a, uh, provides a conservative prediction when you're using the T-headed specimens. And as I said, as a sidelight, Turian and Frosch did a really good job of predicting strength. And now the quantum leap is, remember the interest was using these as ties. And based on what we observed here, and being able to develop the strength of, or the, at least the yield strength of, the transverse reinforcement with the heads on them, these ought to be effective in working as transverse ties in the walls as a substitute for the conventional hook bar uh, arrangement. And with that, I'll be glad to take any questions.